morning, Bishop. Good morning. Good morning. I had a crazy dream. A crazy dream. I know y'all familiar with having crazy dreams. This was one of those crazy dreams, and I, I'm pretty sure that you guys will be able to relate to this type of dream. In the dream, I was sleeping, she pushed me, and that was what rescued me from whatever it was I was on top of me. Now, I know what this was. I know who this person was. It was really, really strange. But for many people, um, that's what, what you experience uh, when it comes to a heaviness of soul, a heaviness of your soul. You have something that's weighing you down, but you can't figure out what it is. It's making it hard for you to move through life. And uh, for the last few weeks, we've been on this whole thing about mood swings. That's the title of the series that we're on, Mood Swings. And how is it that we can keep our moods from controlling us? And I started off by pointing out that it's not the outside circumstances that determine our moods and our attitude. It's what's going on on the inside. And that's why last week we started this whole part about the soul, looking within. It's important that we learn to look within because inside is where the real problem is. If we learn how to cleanse our souls, if we learn how to deal with what's going on on the inside, we will never, ever be mastered by our moods again. And then last week, I, I pointed out something to you guys. This is a very important thought. It should be on the screen. We are not a body with a soul. We are souls with a body. I want to say that again. This is very important. We are not a body with a soul, but we are a soul with a body. And we talked about how, you know, we, we learn how to cleanse our bodies, but we don't really know how to cleanse our souls. It's important that we learn how to cleanse our souls. But in order for us to understand how to cleanse our souls, we have to understand that thought. That we are a soul with a body. When God created Adam, Adam wasn't activated until God breathed into Adam's nostril and then he became a living being. So we need to give more attention to what's going on on the inside than we do of what's going on on the outside, which is the exact opposite of what the culture teaches. The culture teaches that if we dress it up, we'll feel better. And in some cases, that is true. Like, you know, if you put on nice clothes, you wash your car, you drive a nice car, you feel better temporarily. But I'm talking about lasting happiness, being able to be in control of your mood no matter what it is that's going on. You can have a good mood, a good attitude driving in a bucket. You can have a good mood and a good attitude living in an apartment, living in WASP. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter the makeup that you have on. You have to learn how to deal with what's going on on the inside. And so we have to understand this point that our bodies are merely the vehicle that houses our souls, the real us. When we die... Our bodies die, but our souls continue to live. And so since we're going to deal with this body for about maybe 70 or 80 years, and we're going to deal with our souls for billions and billions of years, we need to learn how to give attention to what's going on on the inside. And so we have to learn how to deal with the soul. We have to learn how to deal with our internal beings. I love what David said in Psalm 42. Verse 5, he says, why, my soul, are you downcast? That's what he says. He says, he's, he's talking to his soul. See, a lot of times we, we want to talk to other people, right? When we have issues, we figure, if I can just get her to act right, things will be right. If I can just get him to act right, things will, will be right. Right? If, if I can get in the right environment, if I, if I can talk to the right person, things will be all right. But the truth of the matter is, the real person that you need to talk to is yourself. That, that's what David did. We can learn a lot from David. David spoke to his soul. Nobody else around. Nobody else to talk to. People think you're crazy when you talk to yourself. You really need to learn how to talk to yourself. David said, he's speaking to his soul. 
all, he says, why are you downcast? Why are you disturbed? Where? Within me. In other words, why are you walking around with your mouth stuck out? Why are you always frowning? Why are you always complaining? Why, why can't you find the good in anything? He's talking to his soul, right? He's talking to himself. He's not talking to his kids. He's not talking to his wife. He's talking to himself. He said, why are you walking around moping all the time? And I think this generation, this generation, and what I mean by this generation is everybody that's breathing right now. Not just young people, older people as well. We need to learn some things from David. There's a study that shows that this generation suffers more than any other generation from a low-grade depression. Right. This generation, we have access to more things than we've ever had. The internet, cell phones, technology. Many people have multiple cars. We have a bunch of shoes to choose from, right? But even with all of the stuff, this generation suffers more than any other generation from a low-grade depression. It's one of those things where you, there's nothing really wrong but there's nothing really right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just can't seem to get it together. You can't really pinpoint what it is that has you down, but you're just down. Yeah. Right. Low-grade depression. A heaviness of the soul. Not, not clinical depression. That, that's on a whole nother level, right? And I'm not qualified to address clinical depression. There are things where you need to go and see a professional, or perhaps you might even need medication. But I'm talking about low-grade depression where it's not clinical, but it's just you just can't seem to get a rhythm. You can't seem to get any rhythm in life. I mean, it's just you're down, but you really don't have a reason to be down. I want to give you some symptoms of low-grade depression, not clinical depression. It can lead to clinical depression if you don't address it, and, and you don't necessarily need to address it with medication. See, that's the problem with most people is we try to address these things with medication when God says there's another way to address it. God says you got to start looking within. That's what the Bible teaches. You have to start looking within. And, and you guys know, I, I never preach in a way where we become victims and we can blame other people for our situation. I always preach and teach personal responsibility because I believe that that's what's going to transform our community. That is what has helped me to get from where I was to where I am, not blaming other people because I grew up in the hood just like many of the people that we see in the hood today. But I took personal responsibility for my life. I stopped blaming other people, right? And so when we stop blaming other people, then we can start to grow. And that's really what my whole message is about. My whole message, my life message, if I was to preach one message to this generation, it would be take personal responsibility for your life. Because if you blame other people for your life, that means you need other people to fix your life. Right? But if you take personal responsibility, I'm in a bad mood because I choose to be in a bad mood. Now you're able to fix your mood. Right, right. So I'm going to give you guys some symptoms of low-grade depression. Sadness. You don't know why you're sad, but you're just sad. No longer enjoying the things that you used to enjoy. Remember when life was fun. You, you looked forward to getting up. You looked forward to going to work, to going to school, to playing with the kids. But you no longer enjoy that. Changes in your weight and appetite. You either start losing weight or start gaining weight. You're really not even hungry anymore. Maybe you're even more hungry than usual. Sleep problems. You have a problem with falling asleep at night. That's a sign that you're struggling with low-grade depression or a heaviness of the soul. Restlessness, where you're always tired but you're not able to rest. The mind is constantly going. Low energy, where you just don't have the energy to keep on keeping on. All you want to do is just kind of lay around or sit around. You really don't want to do anything. Fatigue, always tired. 
and it's connected to the fact that you're not getting enough rest, you're not putting the right things in your body, and it really starts with the fact that it's not right in your mind, it's not right on the inside. Feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, or guilt, problems with concentration or decision making, right? It's not clear, and it's like, okay, other people can step back and look at the decision, and it's very clear for them, but for some reason, you just can't get it together in your mind, and then this leads to uh, the last one that I want to point out today, and that is the thoughts of death and the thoughts of suicide, right? When, when you have this heaviness of the soul, when you have this low-grade depression, there are often thoughts of you dying or even thoughts of you causing your own death. And that is a heaviness of the soul. And people live with this constant heaviness of the soul. Can't figure out what's really wrong, but can't figure out what's right either. And so I want to point out for you guys three things that could be the possible causes for you living with a heaviness of soul. And perhaps you're not going through that right now. You might know somebody that's going through that. Or maybe later on down the line in life, you might end up going through that. Because I'm telling you what I know, life can be difficult at times. And every now and then you can get hit with something that you did not expect and it can have you off balance and you can find yourself living with a heaviness of the soul. And so I want to point out three things that could be weighing your soul down which is altering your mood and causing you to go from here to here and you're trying to figure out why. Three things. The first is hurts from the past. Hurts from the past. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, the, the writer says, The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. Notice he said the thought, right? It really starts with the thought. And the mind has the awesome ability to think back in the past, to think right now in the present, and also to think forward in the future. But we have to learn how to control our minds, and when we think back in the past, we can't think back to the past hurts. Because many people, including myself, we rehearse these hurts over and over and over again. And what happens when you rehearse these hurts over and over again, it begins to sink down into your soul and alter your moods. Right. Now I never want to be cavalier about what people have been through in the past because there are people who have been through some very painful things in the past, right? People have been molested, people have been raped, people have been abused physically, people have been misused in business deals, and these things hurt. These things are extremely painful. And oftentimes when we think about these things over and over again, perhaps somebody that you trusted in a relationship and you opened yourself up to this person and you fell in love with this person and this person hurts you, right? And so you're trying to move forward but it's, it's difficult for you to move forward because of the pain and you keep thinking back on the past pain and it keeps seeping down into your soul and altering your mood. He says, the thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. He says, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. I've been through some painful things, and I'm telling you, one of, one of the most painful things that I ever experienced in life was falling in love with the wrong person. Exposing myself, right? opening myself up, making myself vulnerable to the wrong person. And she broke my heart. And I'm telling you, that pain stuck with me for years and years and years. And I tried to establish another relationship and, and the, the pain from the past just kept resurfacing in my new relationship because I kept thinking about the pain and thinking about the pain and thinking about the pain. And that's, that's what can lead to a heaviness of soul, hurts from the past. Another thing that can lead to a heaviness of soul and low-grade depression, which can alter our mood, is trouble in the present. 
Not only hurts from the past, but trouble in the present. Every now and then things can hit us out of nowhere that we did not expect. And it can just throw us off course. And it seems like for some people, everywhere you turn, there is trouble. You did not expect for things to be the way that they are. You did not expect for you to be in the situation that you are in right now. You expected to be further on down the line when you were 25 years old. You expected to be married right now. You didn't expect to be going through some of the same old childish things that you were going through when you were 16 years old. And so trouble in the present can weigh down the soul. Job, his friend, was trying to comfort him when he was going through his issues. And look at what his friend said. But now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but right now, trouble comes to you and you are what? Discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. These are words that characterize a heaviness of the soul, that things are coming your way that you did not expect and you don't know how to deal with it and it can begin to weigh you down. And so hurts from the past, trouble in the present. And the third thing that can weigh heavy on the soul and alter our mood is anxiety about the future. So you have hurts from the past, trouble in the present, and anxiety about the future where you are overly concerned about how things could turn out. Am I going to be single for the rest of my life? Am I going to die from cancer, right? These are things that are running through our minds as we begin to live life, right? And we experience life and we see other people going through things and we begin to wonder, how is my life going to be in the future? One of the things that terrifies me is being a bum. I don't want to be a bum in the future. I'm telling you. And another thing that terrifies me is, is having tubes to attached to me and having people have to change my diaper, right? These things terrify me. I told you guys a story before about when my grandmother passed away from lung cancer and just watching her suffer. And then later on, I ended up getting some pain in my chest. And it's scary because I remember watching my grandmother go through that. And so I went to the, to the hospital, Hubert Humphrey, and they ran some x-rays, and they said, we see some kind of spot over near your right upper lung. And so they said, we're going to make an appointment for you. We don't do it here. We're going to make an appointment for you at Martin Luther King. But the appointment was months down the line. And I'm thinking to myself, like, how am I going to deal with this thought in my mind that I might have cancer for months and months and months? And so I said, I can't wait months. And so I went to down to uh, Harbor General over in Torrance, and I'm in the waiting room, and I'm still thinking about this thing, right? I'm just thinking about this thing over and over and over again. And watch how my mind began to play tricks on me. I'm thinking about this thing, and then they run these x-rays. They put this dye through my body so they can highlight my body to see what this spot is that's supposedly on my right upper lung. But nobody can tell me at this point in time that I don't have cancer. I'm thoroughly convinced that I have cancer. And so I'm sitting there and I'm waiting on them to come back with the results. And so as they, they have a bed in there for me to lay down, but I can't lay down in no bed. I got cancer. And I want to find out how bad this cancer is. And so instead of me laying down in the bed, I sit down in the chair, but I can't sit down in the chair because I got cancer. I got lung cancer what the mind is telling me. And so I get up and I'm looking down the hall and I'm watching my doctor as he's talking to other people down the hall and I'm tricking myself and convincing myself to believing that they're trying to figure out how to tell me that I have cancer. And so I try to sit down but I can't sit down because I have cancer, right? And then I get back up and I look down the hall and, and they're still talking and I'm saying, I'm, I'm convincing myself and tricking myself into believing they're trying to tell me that I have cancer and I have three weeks to live. <laughs> Anxiety about the future. And I remember Pastor Kennard, that's, that's my buddy, that's, that's my father in the ministry. I, I love him. He's always on time. The Lord has a way of using people in your life. He sent me this passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 3. And it says, be anxious for nothing. Yeah. It, says, it, says, it says, be anxious for nothing. 
And I'm telling you, the Word of God addresses everything, right? The Word of God addresses everything along with the Spirit of God who knows what we need, when we need it. He knew that I needed to hear that at that point in time. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, present your request to God, right? And, and the God of peace, His peace will guard your hearts, right? His peace will guard your hearts. Well, long story short, really not a long story short, I gave you guys a little version of the story. Anyway, I didn't have cancer. It was just a shadow from my rib, right? But I played this thing in my mind, right? And that's what many of us, we rehearse this thing in our mind, and we, we predicted doom and gloom for our future. It's going to be bad. I'm going to be by myself. I'm going to die fat, right? I'm going to be broke. I'm going to be homeless. All these things, she's going to leave me. He's going to leave me. All these things that we rehearse in our minds, anxiety about the future can weigh heavy on the soul. But guess what? It wasn't, it's not just me and it's not just you that experienced that. Our Lord Jesus experienced the exact same thing. Look at what he says in Mark chapter 14, verse 33. This is him and this is the, the day before, a couple of days before the cross, right? He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He's going to pray. And he began, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. What does that mean? He had a heaviness of the soul. And he goes on to say, verse 34, my soul, not my mind, not my body, but my soul is what? Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. He says that my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. And so this is depression like nobody has ever experienced before. In fact, if you read some other gospel narratives, it'll tell you that Jesus began to pray and he was sweating drops of blood. That shows you how depressed he was and what was his anxiety about. His anxiety was about the future. The fact that he was going to be separated from the Father for just a moment to deal with our sins. And so anxiety about the future can weigh heavy on the soul. So what, what, what do we do? How do we address this? How do we deal with this? Going back to the verse that we started with in Psalm 42, verse 5, he says, Why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed where? Within me. Now notice the shift. This is important. We've got to learn how to pivot. We have to learn how to shift. We have to learn how to redirect the mind. That is the key, right? Because it's 90% mental. If we don't get the mental piece, we lose the battle. We have to get the mental piece. Notice how he shifted, how he switched. He says, he says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? He's talking to himself. And then he begins to preach to himself. Look at what he says. He says, put your hope in God. Yeah. Who is he talking to? He's not talking to his wife. He's not talking to the people that's blocking him at work. He's talking to himself. He says, put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him. I will yet praise him no matter what happens. I'm determined to praise him. If the doctor would have said it was cancer, I'm still determined to praise him. If all of my friends abandoned me and walked out on me, I'm still determined to praise him. He says, yet I will praise him. David dealt with mood swings. This is the mood swing. But what he did was he swung it from wrong back to right. Many of us, we swing it from right to wrong. We, we, we're in a bad mood. We should be in a good mood. Kids are alive. They're healthy. You got food in the refrigerator. You got a couple of dollars in the bank. But you're still walking around with your mouth stuck out. He says, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. Now, here's the thing that, that keeps people captive to their moods. 
Here, here's the thing that keeps people captive to their moves. Are you guys ready for this? Man, I, I wish you guys had y'all friends here. Y'all friends should be here today. Y'all know y'all know somebody that need to hear this. It don't make no sense for us to have these empty seats in this church. With this good, relevant stuff, right? This is good, relevant stuff right here. I don't waste my time with stuff that's going to go over your head. I want to talk to your life. This is good stuff right here, right? I'm telling you, this is good stuff right here. You know what holds people captive to their moods? Hopelessness. Right. When you feel like it's always going to be that way, that's what holds you captive to your moods. I, I, you know, I talk about my weight all the time. I usually only talk about it when I'm going down. I don't talk to y'all about my weight when I'm going up, right? When, I talk, when I'm going down, I talk to you guys about it because I'm kind of low-key bragging a little bit. But I'm going to brag a little bit this time to make a point, all right? So I'm just going to let you guys know I'm bragging a little bit to make a point. About four months ago, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am right now. I remember the doctor telling me, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, and you have high cholesterol. When I got that news from the doctor, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I know people with those diseases, right? And, and it doesn't end well for them. They end up on dialysis, some of them end up getting things amputated and things like that, right? And so what happened was when I heard this, because it wasn't just one thing, but it was three things, it kind of hit me and it had me down. And I started playing in my mind like, you know what, it's going to always be this way. And so I need to adjust my life in such a way that I'm going to die young, I'm going to die overweight, and I'm going to die from one of these diseases. But then one day God spoke to me. It's, it's so interesting how God speaks. It's not always in church. See, we think that God only speaks in church. And so we're not listening for God in other places. We just wait till we get to church to hear from God. But God is speaking all over the place, and not just in church. And guess what? Not just for Christians. See, that's what broke people off. I'm telling you. That broke people off every time. Because we feel like non-believers can't talk to us. God spoke through a donkey. If he can speak through a donkey, he can speak through a non-believer. Now here's the thing. If we're going to listen to non-believers, we still have to know the truth. Because if we don't know the truth, they can lead us astray. And so if the non-believer says something that confirms something in the word of God, guess what? You can trust what the non-believer said. And so I seen this video, I don't know if it was a non-believer or not, but I seen this guy, he was like really, really huge. He was, he was bigger than me. And I seen the guy, he began to work out, right? He began to work out, he began to put in the work. He began to change his eating habits. And I just watched his transformation. I'm so glad that he chron chronicled his transformation, right? He had it on video. And so, you know, you see some people, you're like, you know, this was me before, and this was me after, and it doesn't even really look like the same person, right? You're like, okay, they just put your face on a different body. But he actually chronicled his journey. He showed what he was like with his shirt off, with his shirt off, I'm telling you, it's, it looked different with the shirt off. Uh -huh. It looked a whole lot different with the shirt off, bro, I'm telling you. <laughs> he showed his journey with the shirt off, and, and he showed how he began to lose weight because of the things that he was doing, and his body began to transform because of the things that he was doing. Not because of what anybody else was doing, but because of what he was doing. And I kept watching what he was doing, and I told myself, if he can do it, I can do it too. And so I began to do the things that he was doing, and I started to see the results. And somebody put on Facebook, they said, what motivates you? I said, results motivate me. Possibilities and results. Possibilities and results. The possibility is that I can live a better life, a better quality of life, that I can have a nice body, right? That's the possibility. The results come when I begin to put in the work. And so I begin to put in the work, and I see that first. It was like, dang, this thing is taking too long. I mean, it's not really happening as fast as I wanted to, but then I started seeing it happening. It was happening. It wasn't happening as fast as I wanted it to happen, but it was happening. And what was happening was, not only was I losing weight, but my energy was going up, and I started feeling better. Right? And so, 
Before, it was the whole, the mindset was, I'm going to always be this way. I started picturing myself before in a casket, a really, really big casket. And then after the funeral, people struggling to carry me out. You guys have seen this before. I know you've seen this before. And I started picturing myself this way. And I said, you know what? I don't want to die that way. I don't want to die obese. I don't want to die overweight. I don't want to live my whole life never experiencing healthy living. I don't want to live that way. And so for most people, the reason why you're enslaved to your mood. The reason why you're held captive to your mood is because you feel like it's always going to be this way. But I want to teach you how to preach a three-point sermon to your soul. If you guys notice, when I preach, I preach three-point sermons. Last week I only gave you one point. But I normally preach three-point sermons. Why? Because the mind can only retain so much. And the mind thinks like that, right? It thinks like that. It thinks in points. It thinks in sections. It thinks in chapters. And so a three-point sermon, I told you guys last week, even if you're not good in front of people, you can still be good at preaching to your soul. There should be no one better at preaching to your soul than you are. You don't have to put on face when you're talking to your soul. You can keep it 100 when you're talking to your soul. You have to learn how to preach to your soul. And I'm going to give you a three-point sermon to preach to your soul. The first thing that you need to tell your soul is that God has been faithful. Come on, see, look, I'm telling you, you guys don't believe this. Y'all don't believe this. I'm telling you, you know, I, I can prove it to you in your life, but I don't have enough time because I want to get you guys out of here in about five minutes. But I'm telling you, God has been faithful. Look at what, what, what the, we, we looked at this earlier. I want to look at this again in Lamentations chapter 3. So you guys don't think that I'm making this thing up, right? Context, 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 right? We read this earlier, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19. The thought of my suffering, remember that? Remember we read that earlier? The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. He's rehashing something that happened in the past, a past hurt. But watch how he preaches to his soul. He says, Yet I still dare to hope. When I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. He reminded himself of the faithfulness of the Lord. He says, His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. Great is His faithfulness. Great is His faithfulness. That's what he says. He says, Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Remember, I told you guys, the mind has the awesome ability to think back in the past. And there's nothing wrong with thinking back in the past. But I can think back in the past and remind myself of the pain that I experienced when people used to tease me about wearing pro wings. See, some people don't know about pro wings. That's what pay that used to sell. Pay that used to sell pro wings. Right? And people used to tease you about wearing pro wings, right? Well, we couldn't afford anything but pro wings. And they looked at my pro wings and they used to tease me about wearing pro wings. I can let my mind go back to that, or I can let my mind go back to the fact that God provided a way for me to have shoes. He's been faithful. I can let my mind go back to the time when I was shot right here, right down the street on Alvin. I was shot. And I'm telling you, the guy was looking to kill me because as he turned the corner on Avalon, he was getting ready to empty that gun, right? But God provided a way for a bus to be run by to block him from killing me. I can think back to when I got shot, or I can think back to when God provided a bus to protect me. I can think back to when I was homeless, been homeless three times. I know a thing or two about being homeless. I can talk to people about being homeless. I thank God. 
that I was homeless. Now I have something to work with when I talk to other homeless people. I can think back to when I was homeless, or I can think back to when God provided for us during that time of homelessness, and he ended that homelessness by using other people and other things. It's all about what we choose yeah. to think about. Yeah. We have to learn how to redirect the mind, and so we have to preach to the soul. We have to preach to ourselves. God has been faithful. Amen. When you start thinking about that crazy stuff in the past, immediately you have to redirect your mind and remind yourself that God has been faithful. So you preach to your mind. Preach to your soul. God has been faithful. Yes. Second thing that you tell your soul, and this is important, you tell your soul, listen to me, you tell your soul, 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 you can call it something else if you want to, soul, you can keep it 100 with God. That's what you tell your soul. You tell your soul that you can keep it 100 with God. That means that you don't have to fake the fun for God. Tell him the real. See, we learn how to pray in church. And there are these church prayers. Some of them, we, we've heard them so many times that we can, we, we can quote them, right? Because they are church prayers. And we take these church prayers back to our closet and we wonder why we're not getting any results because God is like, that's not you. <laughs> That's the pastor's prayer. That's the deacon's prayer. I want to know how you really feel. I want to know what's really going on with you. And I'm telling you, it's so gratifying when you can be 100, right? Even with people, when you have friends that you can just be real with, it's so gratifying because you don't walk around with your guards up. When you're walking around with your guards up, you're tense up. When you tense up, it starts to alter your mood. And so we have to learn how to keep it 100 with God. Psalm 142, verse 2. He says, look at it. He says, I pour out my, what? My complaints. You, you, if, you, if you have a complaint, you need to let God know. I'm not feeling this thing, Lord. I know you said I need to forgive, but I'm having a hard time because she walking around like she ain't did nothing. I know you want me to love them, but I feel like choking them out, Lord. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Learning how to be 100 with God. Here, look, let me tell you where I've grown. Let me tell you where I've grown. I promise you, I'm, let me tell you where I've grown. I've grown to a point where God is now my best friend. Yeah. Amen. He, he, he's my best friend. Hallelujah. Like, look, I tell you everything about me because he already knows everything about me. Yeah. And then when I get to him and I start telling him about me, he lets me know I already knew that. I just wanted you to come clean with me. Okay. Say that, you, you can keep it 100 with God. He says, I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. I'm telling you, I get tired of hearing people trouble. I'm not the one. I'm not. People think because I'm a pastor they can dump on me all the time. I just sometimes I get tired of hearing people's troubles. I gotta feel my own. But God never gets tired of hearing our troubles. If we would learn to start whining and complaining and telling our troubles to God, I'm telling you, it would do more for our moods and our attitudes than it would if we was telling people. Because I'm gonna tell you what people do. They get the yapping about you behind your back. Not everybody. We've got some, a few genuine people represent a very small percentage of the population that you can tell your deep secrets to and it's going to stay with them until they go to the grave. Yeah. But it's not many of them. You can tell your deepest secrets to God and you never have to worry about him talking behind your back. You need to learn how to tell your soul to keep it 100 with God. And then lastly, lastly, the last point of this sermon. Remember, I'm giving you a three-point sermon to preach to your soul. You need to keep this as like a vest pocket where you can always go to. The last thing that you need to 
preach to your soul. And I'm telling you, this will help your mood. This will help your mood. You need to preach to your soul and tell your soul that it can trust, that you can trust God's authority over the future. That's my last point. I'm almost done. It can trust, you can trust your soul. You can trust God's authority over the future, right? There's nobody that can go over God's head. Whatever God is going to do, he's going to do. Whatever's going to happen, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. He has absolute authority over the future. And so what you have to do is you have to remind yourself, you have to constantly remind yourself, because it's so easy to forget that God is in control. He's in control. Many of you heard the story of Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 sons. He was his father's favorite son. His brothers knew that he was his father's favorite son. He made sure that his brothers knew that he was his father's favorite son. And for most parents who say that they don't have a favorite, they're probably lying. They've learned how to manage that thing, but we have favorite kids and favorite areas, right? I mean, it's just life. God has favorites. It said that in John, where it talks about the disciple whom he loved. It doesn't mean that he don't love everybody, but he loves this person in a special way. And so Joseph let it be known that he was his father's favorite, and his brothers hated him for it. And they decided to come up with this plot to get rid of him. One of the brothers stepped in and said, we're not going to kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. Joseph was sold into slavery. He went to prison. The prison people that he met, he became came friends with, they forgot about him in prison, he was abandoned and left alone by his family, by his friends, in prison, out of prison, back in prison, Joseph went through it. Fast forward, there's a famine in the land, God knew that there would be a famine in the land, God allowed there to be a famine in the land, in fact, God caused the famine in the land. There was a famine in the land, and everybody needed to come to Joseph to get food. Everybody, including the ones that mistreated him, the ones that left him out for cold, they came to see Joseph. And they recognized eventually that it was Joseph, his brothers, and they began to weep bitterly, and they were afraid for their lives because Joseph had the power to destroy them. And look at what Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me. That was your intentions. You, you thought you were in control. Your enemies, the haters, they, they think that they're in control. He says, you intended to harm me, but God. I love that. I mean, you just look at the Bible all the way God, so I just love it. He says, but God intended it all for good. God can take the evil, twisted motives of people and transform it for our good. That's how much control he has over the future. Nobody can stop what God has for you. We have to remind our souls of that. What God has for us is for us and nobody can stop it. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for all good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Who brought me to this position? God. God brought me to this position. The position that I now hold and the way that I, he brought me to this position is he took me through some stuff. He took me through some stuff. He took me through the pit. He took me through the prison and all of that, right? And that was designed to prepare me for this elevated position that he has for my life. And there was nothing that you could do. All of your plans, all of your plots did not work because this was God's will for my life. And God has authority over the future. You need to tell your soul that. The last verse I'm going to leave you with, you know this one. Know. And if you don't know this verse, you need to memorize this verse. I'm telling you, you need to memorize this verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. You've got to know this. I'm telling you. Knowledge is intellectual. That's mental, right? I told you it's 90% mental. You have to know this. He says, and we know that in all things, in all things, in the bad, in the trouble, in the trials, in the disappointments, 
in the hurt, in the pain, in all things, God works. God works. Who's working? God. Our job is to know. See, I'm not making this up. It's in the verse. Our job is to know that he's going to work all things together for our good to those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works together for the good of those who love him. But we got to know it. And we have to be called according to his purpose. That means that I have surrendered my life and I'm allowing him to dictate the course of my life. You need to learn how to preach to your soul. Good teaching. You need to tell your soul that God has been faithful. Sometimes it's just a simple reminder. It's just a simple reminder. You need to tell your soul. You, you need to learn how to preach to your soul. And tell your soul you can keep it 100 with God. You don't have to fake the funk with God. And you need to tell your soul that God has authority over the future. Whatever he says is going to happen is going to happen. 